Hi, I'm William Spaniel. Let's learn some game theory. Today's topic is second price auctions. I cover this in lesson 4.1 of Game Theory 101, the complete textbook. A second price auction looks like this. This is a sealed bid auction, and the players are going to be bidding over a good. Now, the number of players here really doesn't matter. It could be two, three, four, 876,304. Doesn't matter. We just have some number of players, and they're submitting sealed bids to an auctioneer. The auctioneer will take those bids, he'll look at all of them, and he'll see which bid is the highest, and he'll give the good to the highest bidder. But instead of the highest bidder paying his price, the price that he wrote down on his slip, as would be the case in a first price auction, the highest bidder pays the second highest price. So it's going to look, the auctioneer is going to look for the second highest bid and have the highest bidder pay the second highest bidder's bid. So for example, Imagine I was auctioning off an hour's worth of tutoring, and because people value my tutoring worth a lot, the bids are $50, $62, $73, and $90. Then the auctioneer will look at these sealed bids. He'll see that $90 is the highest bid, so he will award the hour's worth of tutoring to that $90 bidder, but he'll only have the bidder pay $73. So the $90 bidder doesn't pay $90. He pays $73 because that's the second highest price. Now, this is really interesting because this game has a ton of equilibria, but one equilibrium in particular is way cooler than the other ones. And that is the equilibrium where all players bid their actual value for the good. So in the example of tutoring here, that would mean that each bidder thinks to themselves, how much do they value one hour's worth of tutoring from William Spaniel? And they write down that price on their piece of paper, and that's what they give the auctioneer. They're just actually thinking to themselves, what's the truthful value for how much they value my tutoring? And that's what they write down as their bid. And this is an equilibrium. To see why, we just have to consider two cases. We have to consider what happens if you're a winner and what happens if you're a loser. And we have to show that in either way, or in either case, you do not have any profitable deviations. So let's start off with what happens if you're a loser. If you're a loser and you decrease your bid, well, you were losing before and now you're shrinking your bid, so you're losing again, and you're still receiving nothing in either case. So if you are a loser, you do not have any incentive to decrease your bid because, hey, you're not winning either way, you're still receiving zero. So there's no profitable deviation there if you're a loser and you decrease your bid. You also don't have a profitable deviation if you are a loser and you increase your bid. One of two things could be the case here. If you're increasing your bid, you could be increasing it to not enough to win the auction. You could be increasing it to something below the highest price. If that's the case, you're still losing and receiving nothing. So you do not have a profitable deviation to increase to that price. And you do not have a profitable deviation to increase it higher than the highest bid. Because in this case, although you will win, now you'll be paying more than you actually value the good. Right, So in that case, it doesn't make sense for you to be deviating to that higher price because you go from getting a payoff of zero by losing to a negative value because you're getting the good but paying too high of a price for it. So as a loser, you do not have a profitable deviation from the strategy. And likewise, if you're a winner, you don't have a profitable deviation. Imagine you're that winner. Here, if you increase your bid, you're still winning and you're still paying the second price. That second price is not what you were writing down, it's what the other guy was writing down, the second highest bidder. And so if you increase your bid, you're still winning and you're still paying that second price. So you're not actually changing your payoff here. You're getting the value of the good and you're subtracting out the cost of the second price of the, uh, the second highest bid and that's it. So you're not profitably deviating, you're still getting the same payoff by increasing your bid. What about decreasing your bid? Well, like before, there are two different cases here. If you decrease your bid to something that's still higher than the second highest price, then this isn't you being clever. You actually don't get any extra payoff for this. You're still winning the, the good because you have the highest bid, but because you don't pay your highest price, price, you're paying the second highest price, you're paying that other guy's bid value, which is not changing when you decrease your bid here. So you go from winning the auction and paying the second highest price to still winning the auction and still paying the second highest price. There's no change in your payoff there. There is, however, a change in your payoff if you decrease your price or decrease your bid lower than the second highest bid. If you go lower than the second highest bid, now you're losing and you're receiving nothing. Well, that's not a profitable deviation because before you were winning the auction and you were winning the auction at a price you were willing to pay. So if you're decreasing your bid and losing, now you're not profitably deviating. You do not have a profitable deviation as a winner. You also don't have a profitable deviation as a loser. This is a Nash equilibrium. Now, what's really cool about this equilibrium is that there are four properties that this equilibrium fulfills. First of all, these strategies that we just described are weakly dominant strategies. So this sort of strategy that we just set up survives iterated elimination of weakly dominated strategies. Secondly, it's strategy proof. 
in all of these different games that we've talked about, we've stressed how important it is to think about what the other guy's doing and how you should react to that and how the other guy should react to you reacting to him and so forth. When you're doing a second price auction, you don't have to think about those things. It's strategy proof. You just write down how much you actually value the good and you're done. That's it. There is no strategizing to this. It's that straightforward. Third, it's an honest equilibrium. So what's surprising about a second price auction, again, given the strategic dynamics of game theory, you, you think, hey, everyone needs to be thinking really carefully about everybody else and perhaps lying and bluffing and that sort of thing. Not the case here. You're actually writing down what you honestly believe the value of that good is to you. And then lastly, this strategy where you're writing down your value for the good also works in an environment with incomplete information. So this is a good final note for Game Theory 101 here. Everything that we've done up until this point and including this point is looking at games where I know your, what your payoffs are and what your preferences are and you know what my payoffs and preferences are. So in the context of a sealed bid auction, that would be like saying I know how much you value the good and you know how much I value the good and so forth. Well, Complete information game theory can tell us a whole lot of things. There's a very interesting branch of game theory that deals with incomplete information game theory, where that's that's the case where I don't actually know how much you value the good at, and there's some uncertainty there. But even if we don't know what the other guys value the good at, we can still write down our actual honest values for the good, and that's still an equilibrium. And that's really cool as well. That wraps up this lecture on second price auctions. It also, for now, at least until I add more stuff to the textbook, perhaps next summer, wraps up our substantive material on Game Theory 101. Hope you join me next time when we will have a concluding video to send you off. Take care.